from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We start as we do every day with a check on the markets. Abigail Doolittle is here. So, Abigail, the markets seem to be reeling a little bit from the GDP numbers, even though we sort of expected them. Uh, are they recovering some? A little bit. We are off the lows to some degree, but yes, uh, you know, poor economic data to say the least. That GDP number uh, down 33 percent, the worst on record going back to uh, 1947. A little bit better than estimated, but nonetheless, it really tells you, shows, uh, demonstrates the idea that the government, the excuse me, the economy uh, really came to a halt uh, in that second quarter. Really, uh, you know, hit very, very, very hard. Uh, not not just the GDP numbers, though, David, also the jobless claims numbers um, uh, elevated for a second week in a row, a little bit better than estimated, but nonetheless, uh, 1.4 million or more people filed for a second week in a row. So stocks taking a hit, but you can see that the NASDAQ has recovered just a little bit. Now, one interesting thing is we finally have a little bit of strength for the dollar uh, after the Fed yesterday, a bit in a wild range, now slightly higher. And this is uh, tampering gold. Gold rally is on pause, at least right now down one percent so not a very strong risk appetite on the day to say the least David at the same time Abigail Nasdaq makes me think about tech and we had those big tech hearings yesterday with those four CEOs really getting beaten up we got some big earnings coming out today it, it, does it look like tech might be holding up a bit better uh, today, you know, it's interesting. So that tech hearing yesterday, they, they sort of lucked out, or at least investors in those stocks lucked out to some degree on the fact uh, that the Fed was also uh, happening that day, because I think that that took precedence relative to the stocks yesterday. That was probably more of a psychological overhang. The bigger news is, of course, earnings after uh, the bell today for Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Alphabet. David, that is about 40% of the NASDAQ 100's uh, weighting, about 16%, I believe, of the S&P 500. And the big question here is whether or not these stocks have run too far too fast, not just off the March lows, but also out of uh, the last earnings season. For example, Amazon up about 40% out of uh, the last earnings season. But what makes it so interesting, earnings for the June quarter, David, expected to decline on a year-over-year -year basis by 34%. So that's the basic tension. Are these stocks priced to perfection? Uh, you know, just yesterday on a five-day basis, they had all been down a little bit of a, a blip into, of course, that earn that tech hearing yesterday and this earnings season. Now, over the last five days, we are looking at a little bit of, of strength. It's going to be very interesting to see what they do, in fact, put up uh, after the close, David. Okay, thank you so much to Abigail Duller for that report on the marketplace. In the meantime, there's a lot of politics news out there, including with the President of the United States saying that maybe we should postpone the election because he's not sure he trusts universal mail-in balloting. Welcome now our Bloomberg political contributor. She is Jeannie Zeno of Iona College. So, Jeannie, thank you so much for joining us. This is pretty remarkable. Pr Vice President Biden, uh, the apparent candidate against President Trump, had predicted he might do this, and he absolutely flatly denied it, and now... Now, it's a question he's raising with a lot of question marks, but still, that the president of the United States would suggest the possibility of postponing the election? It's absolutely unprecedented to see a sitting president, he's up for re-election, talking about postponing an election. Of course, we've been through many crises in this country, from the Civil War to the 1918 pandemic to the Vietnam War, World War I and II, and never have we had an election postponed. As you mentioned, he raised it, in fairness to the president, in question marks in his tweet. Um, and, of course, the campaign um, is really not responding at this point. The White House has said talk to the campaign about this. But the fact is the president has absolutely no power to do this um, at all. This would have to be done by an act of Congress. And when he talks about universal mailing, mailing ballots, of course, about 50 percent of citizens are still expected to vote in person despite the pandemic. But to his point, there will be an increase in the use of mail ballots. And research has found very little, if any, evidence of fraud during those mail-in ballot processes. It, may, processes. it may take longer to count, but it, there's no evidence of fraud. And, of course, the president couldn't point to any evidence of fraud in his tweet either. Yeah, so, Jeannie, as you point out, there's that pesky little thing called a federal statute that would be in the way. But beyond that, there's not universal balloting for anything in this country. It's done by the states, isn't it? We can't make all the states get into line. Yeah, absolutely. And there's that. Of course, the you know under the Constitution, Congress has the right to set the time, place, and manner and the date of the election. But the actual, the how we vote is always up to the states, and so there's no way in which that would be done on a universal method. Right now, five states are using mail ballots, and they're using them successfully, and they have been. 
even before COVID hit. So, again, there's no evidence of fraud. There's no evidence that we're going to see all 50 states move to universal mail-in ballots. Um, but there is, of course, this hanging over uh, sort of what's going on with COVID. And it came up during the testimony of Bill Barr um, in, in Congress earlier this week. And he said it's something he hasn't looked into. But, again, nobody in the administration or anywhere else has been able to point to any evidence of fraud like the president suggests in his tweet. And, of course, this is coming, you know, just 15 minutes, his tweet, after the really bad economic numbers that we heard. So there is sort of speculation that this was the president's attempt to change the focus of the conversation, and he's done so successfully on the day, of course, uh, of a funeral at which three former presidents are attending for, for uh, Representative Lewis. So, yeah. you know, it's it's really a, uh, something to note today. He certainly got everybody's attention. In the meantime, another thing that's supposed to happen this week is uh, the former Vice President Biden is reportedly going to choose his vice president candidate. What are we looking at, Jeannie? What do you expect? Yeah, he said he's going to be announcing in early August. There was some speculation it could be as early as Saturday. I don't know if that's going to happen now. Um, but I think, you know, by all accounts, there was, you know, the, the, the former vice president was photographed uh, showing uh, some crib notes with Kamala Harris's name on it. So there's some speculation she remains at the top of the top of the list. And I think that's likely still the case. He hasn't given an indication one way or another, but certainly the number of women that he's talking about and we are hearing about has decreased slightly as some people have taken themselves out of contention. But I do still think that Senator Harris sort of has the lead in the battle for the vice presidency. And President, Vice President Biden, rather, is sort of a cautious uh, man in many respects. And, you know, there is some speculation he will go with sort of a sure thing, which would be Kamala Harris. Not a lot of surprises there. But we don't know. It's hard to predict. Uh, Jeannie, you mentioned the funeral going on right now, even as you speak for John Lewis down at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. And we have the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, speaking later. We'll ha hear from President Obama. We've already heard from former President Bill Clinton. There's another death that we learned about today, and that is of Herman Cain, former cam cam uh, candidate for president, also had been talked about by President Trump as a possible candidate for the Federal Reserve. And I want to talk about Herman Cain, specifically in this connection. He had a particular connection uh, to Jack Kemp. Uh, a particular wing of the Republican Party, which is very fiscally conservative, but very concerned about the plight of the underclass, particularly African-Americans in urban communities. Is there anyone who's carrying that mantle right now for the Republican Party? You know, nobody in the way Herman Cain was. Of course, he was a self-made man. He was a businessman. He was very, as you mentioned, concerned about the plight of people in the, in the lower and the lower middle classes. And he, of course, famously ran for president on his 999 promise. And as we look today, it's, you know, it's hard to find people in the Republican Party carrying that mantle in particular. Um, there are people talking about these issues. Certainly, you know, somebody prominent who comes to mind, but certainly not in the same way, would be somebody like a Mitt Romney. But, you know, Herman Cain certainly, and he also was somebody close to President Trump, we should mention. He was at the rally in Tulsa. Um, so, you know, he is somebody who's been close and somebody who, who had the president's ear. And it's hard to, to figure out who in the White House and close to the president today is making that case. And, of course, the president is not at John Lewis's funeral, nor did he, uh, you know, go to visit him. So it, it's, it's, it, you're hard-pressed to find somebody carrying that mantle today who's close, at least, to the sitting president of the United States, certainly. There was a time, Jeannie, when President Trump said that he really re wanted to reach out to the African-American voter, as well as the Hispanic or Latino voter. Uh, is that still a live strategy for President Trump as he campaigns for president, or has he given up on that, as far as you can tell? He has said that in, in the not-so-distant past, but, of course, if you look at the policies, the policy involving, involving housing that the, he has been trumpeting in the last you know, few days, few weeks on Twitter, um, you're hard-pressed to see how, from a policy perspective, he is doing that. So he has said that, um, but there's no real consistent policy and certainly no sign as we look at the polls that African Americans, Latinos have been moving in any concerted way towards supporting the president. He would have to really 
take a deep turn um, to, to make that case, and certainly we haven't seen that happen. And, of course, you could argue who's been doing exactly the opposite in terms of a lot of his rhetoric, um, it, which, you know, is something that the Republican Party certainly was concerned about after 08, that they can't win if they don't appeal to Latinos and to African Americans. President Trump has not done any of that in a concerted manner. And now the Republicans are in danger, of course, of potentially losing the Senate in a year in which they should hold on to it. And we've talked before about the polls, the fact that it's early going for the polls. Polls can be misleading. But right now it looks like President Trump is struggling a bit, and Republicans generally are, including in the battleground states. What is his path to success? It appears to be law and order, really going after the protesters, some immigration. But, but how does he handle COVID-19? You know, I, I still think his path, you know, they are focusing on law and order. They are focusing on issues of guns. They are trying to focus on the suburbs. I really think his path is still the economy, which is why I suspect this tweet came out today, because those numbers that came out really devastating for the president, these second quarter numbers. I think he's got to handle the economy. And, of course, the, the COVID-19, which, which many people give him very poor numbers on his handling of that so far, and the tweet earlier this week didn't help any. So he's not doing himself any favors in those regards, and Republicans are very, very nervous. You know, it's not lost on anybody. The president was yesterday down in Texas. He should not have to fight for the support of Texans at this point. He should be branching out to places like New Mexico. But he's got to be down there with polls showing Joe Biden within striking error in a state that Democrats really usually don't win in the modern era. So, Jeannie, if the economy is a critical element in the president's path to re-election, as you, as you say, uh, why don't we see him really going to bat hard for that fourth round of fiscal stimulus right now? Why shouldn't he be wanting to spend a lot of money to try to get the economy going before November? I'm a little perplexed at why he isn't right in the forefront of this battle right now. He absolutely should be, and I think that part of his challenge is that it's not just up to him. It's up to Republicans in the Senate, and you've got a real division with members of the Republican Party in the Senate between those who felt that the previous bill went too far and those who want to repeat that. And so they are battling this out, and the president absolutely should want to get that done and move forward to other things like infrastructure. He should want to make an investment so that he can put the economy on sure footing. But he really doesn't have that power to act unilaterally. And I think he's having some challenges with Republicans in the Senate who feel like they've stood with him for so long. And now you've got places like the Cook Political Report saying they could easily or, you know, at least possibly lose the Senate overall. That's, you know, a real problem for Republicans if they if they lose the Senate. But still over 90 days to go. A lot of things can happen, as you know so well, Jeannie. Thank you so much for being with us, as always. That's Bloomberg political contributor Jeannie Zeno. More Balance of Power. That's coming up next. And this is Bloomberg. Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for First Word News. For that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. President Trump is suggesting the idea of delaying November's election to avoid mail-in voting fraud. He tweeted it will be, quote, the most inaccurate and fraudulent election in history, end quote. The coronavirus pandemic has prompted many states to expand and ease restrictions on their mail-in and absentee voting options, but there has been no evidence of widespread voter fraud through mail-in voting. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says November's election date is set in stone. Funeral services are underway in Atlanta at the church, once led by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., for a man who was at the front lines of the civil rights movement. Congressman John Lewis is being remembered at Ebenezer Baptist Church with three former presidents in attendance. Former President Barack Obama will deliver the eulogy. Lewis died July 17th at the age of 80. Bloomberg Terminal customers can watch the services for Congressman Lewis on Live Go. One of the most prominent Americans to contract the coronavirus is dead. Herman Cain, the pizza executive turned Republican presidential candidate, had been in the hospital since July 2nd, less than two weeks after attending President Trump's rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Cain's office says he didn't know when or how he contracted the disease. 
In April of 2019, Kane withdrew his name from consideration for a seat on the Federal Reserve Board over past sexual misconduct allegations. Herman Kane was 74 years old. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is warning his country the coronavirus pandemic is far from over. And the Prime Minister tells the BBC he sees signs of a second wave coming. Johnson said it's vital for the UK to keep its focus and discipline and not, quote, delude ourselves that somehow we're out of the woods or that this is all over, end quote. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. As we've been talking about throughout the broadcast, the U.S. GDP numbers came out today, and they were pretty bad. Not quite as bad as expected, but pretty bad. They were declining something like 10 percent during the quarter, which made for an annualized rate of 33 percent nearly. Welcome now, Michael McKee. He is our chief economics and policy correspondent here at Bloomberg. Mike, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it wasn't quite as bad as expected. It was really bad, historically bad, worse since 47. Were there any bright spots? Uh, not really. At this point, um, you have to just kind of put this in the rearview mirror. You're right. 1947, 2008, we saw declines of 1.9 percent. So 32 percent, 32.9 percent is it just blows that out of the water. If you were going to look for anything hopeful in this report, you would look at inventories. They fell by a massive amount, $315 billion. That doesn't normally happen in recessions. When people stop buying, usually inventories build up. But in this case, they collapsed. And so uh, if we do see the economy start to reopen again, then the companies will have to build more stuff. And that could uh, help the economy get going again. Do we have a sense that it was coming back by June? Is, is it that granular? We, we don't have a sense. I mean, we look at the monthly numbers, and we did see a uh, real collapse in April and May. In June, things started to get a little bit better, and that took some of the edge off. For example, the uh, trade numbers that we just got this week show the uh, trade deficit narrower than expected, which means uh, good news for GDP. Uh, but what everybody's watching and what Jay Powell of the Fed was uh, on about quite a bit yesterday was the high frequency indicators that we have been getting since the 1st of July. They seem to have been uh, rolling over the number of people who are getting on airplanes, the number of people making restaurant reservations, credit card sales, that sort of thing. Uh, those numbers have slowed down and it does suggest that the economy, if not uh, going back into con contraction at least has stalled. At the same time, Mike, as a practical matter, when you go down as much as 33 percent, annualized rate 33 percent, doesn't that mean that Q3 has almost got to be positive? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's why some people see a V-shaped rebound. I mean, the problem is, is uh, uh, 33 percent going down is not uh, 33 percent gain going up. You're going to have to gain a lot more going up to get uh, that kind of, uh, to, get, to get back to where you were. And people are thinking that's going to take well into 2021 or 2022 until we just get to where we were at the end of 2019. You can see the fall off and how steep it is there. So while we may get a bounce in the third quarter, it's not going to make us whole. These comparisons must be just awfully difficult to make, but I'm really struck by the fact that Europe, which really had an awful situation with coronavirus, they're not going down 33 percent annualized rate by any means. And good, look, goodness sakes, look at China. Uh, and they've had a tough time with coronavirus, too. Why are we doing so much worse than the rest of the world? At least it looks like that to me. Well, you have to really uh, compare them on a non-annualized basis. Germany put out their GDP numbers today, and they fell 10.1 percent quarter over quarter. Ours was a 10 percent decline quarter over quarter. So about the same. France, Italy are expected uh, tomorrow morning to report even worse numbers. So the second quarter was bad all over the world. It's really going to be a question of how fast other economies rebound. And there are signs that they are coming back faster because they've controlled the virus much better. Our problem is people are still afraid to go out and uh, governments are still shutting down industries uh, like restaurants and bars in the United States, whereas they're opening them up in Europe. Uh, so um, w it takes us back, all roads lead back right now to Congress in the fourth round of stimulus. Uh, what sorts of hope went we get if we get $1 trillion, $1.5, $1.75, pick a number. What kind of help could that give us in the GDP numbers? Well, it's really a mix, David. It depends on how they uh, allocate the money. What you need is some money to keep the people who are unemployed 
uh, keep their heads above water, whether it's $600 a week in extra payments or $400 a week. Uh, you need something uh, to keep the people who are uh, not going to get their jobs back quickly afloat. Then you need some money for states and localities because they've spent so much and taken in so little in sales tax revenue that they're going to have to lay people off if they don't get some kind of help. Okay, thank you so much to Michael McKee reporting on those GDP numbers. And as we've said before, there is a funeral going on right now in Ebenezer Baptist Church down in Atlantic, Georgia. That is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s church. This is a funeral, of course, for, uh, for James Lewis, for John Lewis, the, the late great civil rights leader. We're going to go and listen now to a little bit of Andrew Lawson, an activist yeah. speaking. We're about to hear a little bit later from former, pre former President Barack Obama. In the same city at the same time, I count as being providential. We did not plan it. <laughs> we were all led there. And when Kelly Miller Smith and the National. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. It's time now for Stock of the Hour, and it's UPS. It is really surging now, I guess the most for one day since in 20 years, because all of us are getting all those UPS trucks showing up at our houses delivering things. Kayla Lines is here for a report. Yeah, really big gain for UPS today, David. It's up 15% actually trading at a record high. They blew it out of the water in the second quarter because in this stay-at-home world where e-commerce is booming, that means a lot of online orders that have to get delivered. Average courier volume for UPS jumped 23% in the quarter for the U.S. That was driven mostly by a 65% surge in residential deliveries, and that led to a 13% jump, percent jump overall in revenue in the period. I would point out, David, analysts actually thought revenue was going to fall fall on a year on year basis this quarter. So this is a huge upside surprise and a big surprise on the bottom line too. earnings of $2 and 13 cents a share was about double the average analyst estimate. I will say if there is a negative spot of the report to point out it's the margin pressure because yes we're getting a lot more at home deliveries but not as many business to business and the business to business is really the lucrative one the uh, domestic profit margins were weighed on by the fact that this is more at home oriented they fell to just 9.3 percent in the quarter from 11 percent in the same period a year ago and i would also note david ups didn't provide any forward guidance here because of the uncertainty surrounding the recovery on the call. Executives did say they expect demand growth in the third quarter to be lower than it was in the second. But overall, this was a pretty positive report from UPS. And clearly, the market is taking it that way today, yes, David. Good to know that all that money we're spending online is benefiting somebody and appears to be benefiting UPS. Thank you so much to Kayla Lyons. Coming up here, we're going to talk with Michael Faroli. He is J.P. Morgan Chief U.S. Economist about those abysmal, if I can call them that, GDP numbers, also some troubling jobless claims numbers. Where is the U.S. economy? Where is it headed? We'll ask Michael Faroli of J.P. Morgan. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, GDP numbers for the second quarter of the United States came out almost as bad as we expected, down at an annual rate of about almost 33%. And at the same time, if that weren't enough, jobless claims really remained stubbornly high. Welcome now, Michael Faroli, Chief U.S. Economist at J.P. Morgan Securities. Michael, great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I must say, your note says it all, in a sense. It's shocking, but it's not surprising. Right. So, you know, I think estimates for this quarter... Uh, have been pretty bad really since the end of March, early April, right? So it was no surprise at that time that shutting down a large part of the economy, even for a few weeks, was going to have a pretty debilitating effect on these growth rates, particularly when you annualize them. Uh, so we got pretty much what we were looking for. The composition was also very similar to what was expected in particular, uh, consumer service spending, so restaurants, theaters, things of that nature really took the biggest part of the hit. Um, now, you know, obviously the question is what happens next, given that this was so well telegraphed for so many months in advance. I think you are correct to point to the, uh, to the jobless claims numbers because those give us a pretty uh, high frequency look at the economy. And I think really one of the interesting things about this whole COVID experience has been how the whole economics profession and financial markets have really put so much effort into getting things that are available at a weekly or an even, even a daily frequency. Uh, but what that has meant is that the, the monthly and quarterly numbers we uh, often looked at are now 
I won't say stale, but they are, uh, we're, we're already kind of looking ahead to what July may hold. And, and uh, I think some of the indicators about what July holds uh, it looks certainly a, quite a bit softer than the boomy kind of rebound numbers you had in well, the jobless, num the jobless numbers we get every week, which is terribly helpful, but some people are relying on even faster numbers, things like mobility yeah. numbers that come out that are almost instantaneous. What are you seeing there? Yeah, that's right. So uh, within some of the daily numbers, there's mobility numbers. There's uh, actually an uh, increasing number of credit card and debit card numbers, including from, uh, from our bank, as well as uh, that the Bureau of Economic Analysis has been producing. So that gives us kind of a daily look into uh, how spending is uh, is going and it seems like the rebound in, or the recovery in spending in July um, slowed relative to the pace of May and, and June. Now it does look like July spending is probably going to be up relative to June, but you got to remember in May and June you had really big uh, rebounds, and that appears to be petering out a little bit here uh, in July and, and particularly in late July. So that suggests, uh, you know, it, it gives us a signal that is consistent with what we're seeing in the jobless claims numbers, which is one of uh, not contraction, but a slowing in the pace of recovery. And, and you know, we dug into such a deep hole in, in March and April that we, you know, we, we need rapid rates of, of growth to hope to get back to where we were. And uh, the, I think what we're seeing in July suggests that uh, we may not be um, achieving that. So that's uh, a bit of a concern. Um, you know, one thing I would point out is that given what we know about May and June, uh, it seems like the June level of, uh, of activity was above the second quarter average. And so what that's going to mean is that you're going to have, even if you have, you know, sequentially rather soft uh, July, August, September numbers, you could still get a pretty boomy uh, third quarter GDP number, but that may be um, in a way a bit misleading in terms of what's actually going on with the economy as we kind of go through the summer months here into the early fall. So, so, so you, you said it, Michael, the real big question on a lot of people's mind is when do we get back to where we were? And a lot of us are sort of like the kids in the back of the car that say, when are we going to get there, dad, mom? Mm -hmm. uh, are you stretching out that number for you? Because initially people were saying maybe by the end of this calendar year, and that was the first quarter of next year, 2021. What are you at J.P. Morgan looking at now for when you think is a realistic time in the bell curve to basically yeah. be back to where we were? So we don't have... Uh growth getting back above uh, the levels we saw in the fourth quarter of last year, even through the end of next year. Uh, so we have a pretty slow recovery. We think that uh, the level of GDP is probably going to be at the end of next year, 5% below uh, what we thought it was going to be at the end of, uh, of last year. So we, have, we, we do believe there is some permanent damage uh, to the economy here. Uh, and I think the question probably for most people uh, in terms of when do we get there, is when do we get back to full employment? When do we get unemployment levels below 5%? And that's going to be, again, quite some time. It's very hard to see that. We've had some pretty rapid improvements uh, in unemployment the last two months as furloughed workers went back to their old places of employment. And that's kind of a one-time dividend. Uh, going forward, it may be harder to sustain those types of uh, jobs numbers. Obviously, next Friday, the, uh, the marquee uh, report will be the July employment report. Um, uh, and we'll see if we get further improvement there. But right now, with an unemployment rate at 11 percent, uh, getting to 5 percent employment is a, is a pretty long, uh, pretty long journey, most likely. So um, yeah. <laughs> when we get there, I, I, I would uh, I would I would uh, caution patience. Yeah, the kids in the back of the car should be patient for the time being. <laughs> but l let me ask you, as you look at those sorts of projections, whatever they come out at, do you factor in or not factor in a fourth round of stimulus right now as we speak? We're waiting for Congress to sort of get its act together, come to some agreement mm -hmm. on a fourth round. Are you assuming there will be, and what difference will that make? We are assuming uh, there will be, that it will be at least a trillion dollars in size. Uh, I think without that, we would be looking at a pretty huge fiscal cliff uh, in terms of third quarter incomes. Uh, so one of the interesting things in this morning's report was just how strong uh, disposable income growth uh, actually was, and that sounds a little... Uh, strange that we're in a recession and we have record strong disposable income growth. Well, that was all really due to the stimulus checks and the unemployment benefits. And, you know, maybe we, perhaps we do want to wean ourselves off of that over time. But if we do that cold turkey, I'm afraid that in the third quarter, we would have a pretty uh, big fall in income and presumably in consumption. Uh, so our, our forecast assumes 
uh, another stimulus. Uh, and it does seem like both parties uh, at least conceptually agree with that. Certainly the stimulus checks uh, seem to be an area of, uh, of common ground. Uh, and they're fighting obviously over, not obviously, but uh, one of the main points of contention is the unemployment benefits. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it may be, uh, we may have an interesting uh, it, uh, period ahead when we, we could have a, a week or two lapse in the $600 weekly bonus uh, payments, which, you know, we just mentioned a few moments ago that we're now looking at daily uh, spending and daily mobility uh, uh, numbers. And we may see in a daily, at a daily frequency, whether these $600 uh, weekly um, checks are having a big impact on spending. Michael, you talk about weaning ourselves off of it, maybe gently weaning ourselves off of it. Is there any prospect of this uh, until we get a vaccine? I guess what I'm asking is, as an economist, do you think we can learn to live with this disease and grow the economy? Or basically, are we going to have to keep building these bridges uh, on the economy, both fiscally and monetarily, until we get a vaccine? Yeah, I think building bridges is the right way to put it. And and we had hopes uh, earlier in the in the spring that Without a vaccine, we could still uh, have enough control over the virus that activity could return to more normal levels. That's looking, given the, the experience of the last several weeks, that's starting to look uh, a little on the optimistic side. I don't think we necessarily, without a vaccine, we're necessarily frozen uh, in April levels of activity. But without a vaccine, it seems hard to get back to, you know, call it January levels of activity. So. Uh, I would say we, and I believe others, have scaled back our optimism on how much normalcy we can expect, uh, uh, given what we've seen in states that have reopened and reopened uh, perhaps a little too quickly uh, with the attendant effects on, on economic activity. Okay, Michael, thank you so very much. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. That's Michael Faroli. He's J.P. Morgan Chief U.S. Economist. And now for Bloomberg First Word News, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, Democrats are scaling back plans for next month's national convention. They'll meet for just two hours each night of the event in Milwaukee. Joe Biden is expected to accept the party's presidential nomination on the final night of the convention, which runs August 17th through the 20th. Delegates will cast ballots remotely beginning next week, and everyone attending in person will have to wear a mask. The coronavirus pandemic continues to hit Florida hard. The state reported 253 new COVID-19 deaths today, the third straight day of record fatalities. The state's largest school district announced it will begin the school year virtually on August 31st, despite a push by Governor Ron DeSantis to have school districts provide an in-classroom option. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the United States has warned Russian officials about all threats that Russia poses to the U.S. But testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Secretary Pompeo wouldn't say whether he had specifically raised allegations that Russia was paying bounties to the Taliban to kill American troops in Afghanistan. On Wednesday, President Trump said he had not discussed the bounty allegations with Russian President Vladimir Putin. The European Union is extending sanctions against dozens of North Korean officials and agencies because of Pyongyang's continued efforts to develop nuclear missiles. The sanctions will be reviewed again in a year. The EU has imposed sanctions on several countries, notably Iran and Venezuela, but the measures against North Korea, which were first introduced in 2006, are its toughest. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. Coming up, the United States is heading back to Mars, and it's not the only one. We talk with NASA Deputy Administrator Jim Moorhart about what could be an historic mission. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
as the countdown to Mars continues. The perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the Red Planet. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. As you can watch right there earlier today, NASA launched a, a Perseverance rover to go to the moon to do exploration, oh, I'm sorry, to Mars, I beg your pardon, to do exploration once again. There is the rocket taking off. We're watching on TV. You can hear it on the radio as well. And we are welcoming now the Deputy Administrator of NASA. He is Mr. Jim Moorhart. So, Jim, thank you so much for being with us. Give us a sense of this Perseverance mission exactly. What is it? How big is it? How complicated? And why are we doing it? David, first off, it's an honor to be with you, and thank you for having us. You know, Perseverance launched today, and we're so excited because this is the dawn of a new space age. And what, why are we sending it? It is a precursor mission in anticipation of astronauts going to Mars. The president's told us to get to the moon in preparation to do that, but also, ultimately, we've got to get to Mars. This rover is going to be there picking up samples that we're going to return on another mission back to Earth. So it's really part of a round trip mission uh, to another planet, which will be the first time ever. We've also got a helicopter on it, and uh, we're gonna see if it can fly. Uh, it's about four pounds, the rotors are, there are two of them, and it's uh, about four feet long. Uh, and we're really gonna see whether we can use it uh, one, at possibly as a forward scout in the future, but also maybe as a communications relay if our astronauts get out of sight of home base or their rover. So, so Jim, there's so much of this that I find fascinating, but let's stop with the helicopters for a second. The, the atmosphere, as I understand it, on Mars is much thinner than on Earth. What challenges does that raise? Why do you think you can fly a helicopter with a lot thinner atmosphere? You know, we've been practicing in a chamber at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, the density of the atmosphere on Mars is 1% that of Earth's. So it is going to be challenging. But again, that's why we're sending it up there to see if we can do it. That's what we try to do the impossible at NASA. And uh, this is one of them. And I did not realize you're going to actually send another mission up to retrieve uh, samples and bring them back. That certainly has never been done before. When do you hope to do that? You know, that's, uh, that mission is called Mars Sample Return. And the hope is that they'll be bringing those samples back by 2031. Fascinating, fascinating. Now, we're not the only ones shooting for Mars right now. China's got a, a, a rocket going up there. We also have UAE. Give us a sense of what they're doing and how it compares with what we're doing. You know, it's, uh, first off, UAE has been a great partner. And they're actually working with three universities in the United States in preparation for their, their mission called HOPE. So we've been right there with them. We're Jim Bridenstine, the administrator, and myself were on the phone with them just a few weeks ago. Uh, so that's gone really well. Yes, China is also sending up uh, a uh, an orbiter and uh, hopefully a rover. A rover. Uh, again, you know, we we welcome everyone, uh, you know, that want to work together in space. And when I say that, it's about safety. It's about sharing data. It's about being timely with sharing that data. All those things are so important. You know, our job is to bring the world together, and that's what we're trying to do. One of the things that strikes me, Jim, that you've been doing is really having a mix of private and public enterprises really coming together. We certainly have seen with SpaceX, we've seen the Falcon and things like that. Is there a role for the private sector even in something as far away as Mars, or is it more for Earth orbit? You know, David, thank you for the question. First off, you know, we just launched our two astronauts last month. I think you were talking to the administrator then about it. And uh, hopefully they're gonna be coming back on Sunday. So our eyes are gonna, we're gonna be heading to mission control very soon to start preparing for that return. But with that, you know, we really as NASA, in a, the Apollo era, we developed, we built, and we launched rockets and capsules. Today, we wanna be a customer to the likes of SpaceX or Boeing or Blue Origins or others. So, you know, you know where we are with, you know, with the current economy. And we know this is the only way we're gonna be able to continue deep space exploration. Is NASA gonna to continue to be involved? Absolutely. But in the meantime, we need to have the commercial marketplace expand in low Earth orbit 
take it to the moon, and hopefully take it farther out to Mars. You know, as you say, we've talked to Jim Bridenstine, the, the administrator, about uh, commercial applications with respect to Earth orbits. Are the commercial applications that you anticipate in Mars, I mean, how could, let me be frank, how can a company make money off of that? You know, David, think about it. One of the things we're going to do, and again, we're going to prove a lot of this out. The president's told us, get to the moon by 2024. We're going to have the first woman and the next man land on the moon at that point in time. But the real intent is to prove out what we need to do and know before we go to Mars. Part of that is a demonstration of what we call in situ resource utilization. We know there's water ice at the south pole of the moon. We're going to see whether we can harvest that water ice for oxygen to breathe, for water to drink, and very importantly, hydrogen as fuel. If we can see that we can do that, we know there's water 15 kilometers underneath the surface of Mars. Again, we may be finding ourselves in a having stepping stones get to the moon. The gravity well of the moon is one sixth that of Earth. It'd be a lot easier to launch those right. that infrastructure right. from there. Right. So we'd save a lot of money. We may be able to do that on Mars too. Right. It's how we can get right. to deep space economically. And, and finally, Jim, uh, put this in context. You mentioned we have a lot of economic challenges here. It's not just economic challenges. We've got some biological ones with a pandemic yeah. globally. How important is it for us to be reaching as far as Mars right now in this point in our history? You know, you think about what we've done. Think of Apollo and all the things that Apollo brought to us. This camera that I'm communicating through with you wouldn't be here if we had not had Apollo. The digital revolution occurred and many other things we got from that effort. And we expect we'll be inventing many more new things with this effort. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very exciting for those of us who were around back uh, when we landed on the moon. I remember I was a teenager at the time. And uh, this really re brings back some very fond memories, Jim. David, you know, you think about it, this splashdown that's coming with commercial crew, half yeah. of America have never witnessed a splashdown yeah. like you and I did. Yeah. So I think that's going to be even bigger than what just happened today. Yeah, f fair enough. You're making me feel my age, which I should, but it's really terrific. It's more age than you have, Jim. Thank you so much. So that is Jim Moorhart. He is the Deputy Administrator of NASA. And this is Balance of Power, and we are on Bloomberg Television, and we are on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, there are some of us left who remember the old Kodachrome film back when we, before we had smartphones and pixels that we could take pictures with. Well, Kodak, the maker of that, has really f fallen on hard times with the shares going down as low as $2, but this week surged back up to $37 a share after the Trump administration issued the company a $765 million loan. Kevin's really spoke with Adam Bowler, the CEO of the U.S. International Finance Development Corporation, which is the entity that is issuing Kodak the loan. So what happened is when we got this authority, our goal was basically to say, how do we ensure, no matter what happens, pandemic going forward, that Americans are safe and secure? And one of the first focus areas was generic pharmaceuticals. Because in generic pharmaceuticals, 90% of the drugs that we take every single day, they're made in China, they're made outside the United States. And so we said, how can we bring those home? Because how can you sleep well at night if you don't have domestic manufacturing? So the interesting thing about Kodak is you think about what Kodak does historically, right? Everybody, Cameras. they make camera, they make film, yeah. right? How do you make film? You make film with chemicals. It's a chemical process. That is how you make ingredients for generic pharmaceuticals. Uh, and so they came to us and they said, we're going to repurpose these factories we already have. I went to their campus. I was at their campus yesterday. Billions of dollars invested. We're going to repurpose it, and we're going to make basic building blocks for pharmaceuticals 
And that's how it came about. You know, it's been one of the untold stories of the pandemic, or I think one of the optimistic stories, is seeing whether it's breweries and distilleries making hand sanitizer, now a camera company, a film company making hydroxychloroquine. But what stood out specifically about their application? I would imagine you got a ton of applications. We get a ton of applications, and what I liked about it was, one, they had a huge advance order. So my goal in doing this, this is not a handout, okay? We don't do handouts. This is about investing in a company that is going to not only produce 25% of the generic pharmaceuticals that we need, the ingredients in the United States, but it's going to be financially sustainable for the long term. So they had a big advance purchase order, and we were able to give them that money, the $765 million, collateralized on that. So I knew we're going to build a brand, we're going to make Americans safer, and we're going to make money for the American taxpayer, not lose it. From a national security perspective, you mentioned about the different parts of, of medicine and the supply chain that are, that are utilized by China. So as you continue to review process for other applications, what are you looking for and how important is it that the U.S. be stronger domestically so that it's not at a disadvantage of China? I think the way I think about it is we all buy power off the grid today, but a lot of people have backup generators. You cannot be dependent in critical areas on foreign countries. It doesn't mean you don't buy off the grid. It doesn't mean you don't leverage, but we need a core competence here. So we're going to go through systematically, area by area, are we making the PPE that we need here? I don't ever want to be at risk. One of the things we need to know in the context of this pandemic is you learn lessons. Um, and you take those lessons so that this doesn't ever happen again. Uh, so we're going systematically, area by area, to identify. That was Adam Bowler. He is the head of the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. He's made that huge loan to Kodak. Coming up with the second hour of Balance of Power over on the radio, we're going to talk about those antitrust hearings yesterday with Diana Moss. She's the president of the American Antitrust Institute. And this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.